Are we heading into a new age of politics? We're asking if the Occupy movement has changed the way we hold governments to account. Also on today's program, five years of South Sudan. We're looking at why the world's newest country could be its next failed state. And in picture this, the hunt for survivors after Ecuador's most powerful earthquake in decades. Hello and welcome to the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garta. First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. 2011's Occupy movement came about as a response to social and economic inequality. The 1% against the rest. It spawned several imitators across Europe and further afield. Spain's Indignados movement began as street demonstrations in 2011 and ended up with Podemos, now one of the country's largest political parties. Greece's Syriza won elections on a platform of challenging the country's international creditors. But it's been blunted by power, unable to enact some of its more radical dreams. So is this just a period of upheaval and everything will probably go back to the way it was? Or could this be the start of a new world order? Our newsmaker today is the Occupy Movement as we ask if it can finish what it started. It started as a protest against a new labor law. On March 31st, hundreds of thousands of students and labor unionists marched against their socialist president, François Hollande, angry over new plans to create jobs by reducing protections for workers. But some of them still haven't gone home. In central Paris, protesters have been staging nightly sit-ins for weeks, creating a movement called Up All Night. In Place de la République, participants debate everything, from the migration crisis to climate change and tax evasion. The aim here and everywhere in France, just like in other countries such as Greece, Spain, Italy or even Canada, when they held a general strike in 2014, is to rebel against the powerful and scare them. We want fear to switch sides. It's taken on a revolutionary feel and sit-ins have spread across France. So is Nuit Debout the start of a new political movement? Or have we seen it all before? <laughs> 2011, Wall Street, New York. A movement against social and economic inequality was born. Protesters, fed up with capitalism, occupied the city to take a stand against corporations and the super rich. The message gathered pace across America and spread to more than 82 countries around the world. But the movement hasn't succeeded in toppling capitalism. What it did do was spawn other anti-establishment groups. In Europe, a crippling debt crisis launched a wave of protests against job cuts and austerity drives. The indignados in Spain led the way. In Hong Kong, the so-called umbrella revolution directed its anger to Beijing, not to meddle in its affairs. But like their tents, these movements have largely been packed away. Critics argue most protests lacked a coherent message. But participants say a display of dissatisfaction was enough to raise eyebrows and enter politics. Social justice parties have recently become players in mainstream politics. In 2014, Greece's Syriza party rose from being a protest movement to winning a general election. Catalonia's anti-austerity Podemos party is now the third largest political contender in Spain. Whatever their politics, these former fringe parties are answering calls for new voices in power, a sentiment that some argue started in Wall Street. It raises the question, had it not been for these social revolutions, would a former trade unionist like Jeremy Corbyn have emerged as the UK's Labour Party leader? Or would a vocal critic of corporate greed like Bernie Sanders have become a front-runner to lead the most powerful capitalist country in the world? Sandra Gatman, The Newsmakers. Now to discuss the Occupy Movement's legacy is Nick Vonica, a correspondent for Politico in Paris. 
and Michael Leviton, editor of Occupy.com and co-founder of the Occupied Wall Street Journal. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. This conversation will expand and contract. Let's start with Paris for the moment. Michael Leviton, are these protesters up all night to get lucky, or are they up all night really to change their society? I think it's uh, pretty evident that they're <clears throat> joining this uh, really a global movement uh, to bring about some transformational change that uh, you see their connection with labor leaders, with the unions. That's something uh, a bit new and a bit like a, a progression, a new stage in the social movement um, demands. But I think they're really out to to see su more sweeping, more more transformational political change. They're unhappy financially, economically, politically. The release of the Panama Papers, I think, only adds to that anger, and they want to see a more competent and uh, and a government that, uh, that works for the people a lot more, which is what social movements across the world these last five years we've been seeing. Nicholas, do you think that they're being deliberately vague? Because on the one hand, they don't seem to have anything absolutely specific that they're calling for. But on the other hand, how do you respond to protesters who won't accept anything less than the downfall of, of global capitalism? I think the, the position of, of not making specific demands was uh, part of a strategy because they said they just wanted to foster dialogue and, and, and get uh, a, a debate going about uh, what should change in society. Um, I think it's been a, a good position for them because uh, it's prevented the government from saying, well, here's how we respond to your demands because we, we don't know exactly what they are. Uh, I think that the, the situation has changed somewhat uh, with some of the violent incidents and, and the eviction of a uh, French intellectual at the weekend, um, some of the, the tolerance and the benevolence toward the Nuit Debout movement is uh, going away. And, and people are saying, even the government, the left-wing government is saying, uh, now it's time for you to uh, formulate more precisely what it is you want and, and how we may uh, respond to that. Michael, there's, an, there's a feeling of betrayal uh, there isn't there. I mean, uh, Francois Hollande is socialist. He's progressive. He's supposed to be for all the things that they want. Do you see parallels with those uh, progressive millennials in 2011 and 2012 who felt let down by President Barack Obama in the U.S.? Yeah, I think that's an interesting comparison. I mean, um, the fact that Hollande is of the socialist party the way that Barack Obama is of the Democratic Party, it does not mean that they are, you know, leaders that represent a real populist people's democratic movement. They are firmly of the establishment. They are carrying out establishment mainstream policies that they've done for decades. And clearly those leaders, Hollande, like Obama before, are not willing to dramatically shift course and somehow uh, give the people what they want on the spot. Uh, obviously, they'd like to quell these protests. In America, how it worked was a federally coordinated crackdown of, you know, dozens of encampments with mass arrests, and we saw that. And that's generally the way governments, even so-called left of center ones, finally learn to deal with the issue. They, they don't want it to go on too long. Uh, the longer it goes, the, the more popularity, the more recognition around the world. They, uh, they gain. So uh, I think that, I think, that, and to respond to Nicholas's point about demands, I mean, Occupy Wall Street, one of the core features, characteristics of it was that it did not give or release demands. The idea was that when you demand something that cannot be given, such as such profound structural reform, structural changes, not the downfall of capitalism, as you said earlier necessarily, but serious, profound reforms that take into account the needs of the 99 percent, which our system is far from, from, uh, from addressing. Uh, if you're not going to have those demands met, why issue them? It's somehow seen as, a, uh, as conceding to uh, the narrative of the mainstream and of the establishment. I think that's one reason these movements refrain from, from offering specific demands. They don't want them rejected outright. And the demands are so large that they can't possibly be met overnight by one regime, by Hollande, by Obama. But I think as we're seeing with these movements growing and evolving and changing and spreading from country to country, the message is clear. There's, it's a shared message. It's a global message. And um, it's hopping from one place to another. And I don't think governments mm -hmm. are capable of, of uh, stopping this message. Talking about this global message, Nicholas, uh, Yanis Varoufakis, the former Greek finance minister, 
is getting involved. Do you think that he's being opportunistic and smuggling himself into this process disingenuously, or he's actually providing a strong transnational moral voice to the protests? It's difficult for me to judge. I know Yanis Varoufakis has a new book coming out, and uh, you know he, he's very good at showing up in places where there are going to be TV cameras and, and a spotlight on him. Um, I would agree that you know Nuit Debout has become a, a, a rallying point for um, a certain sort of protest movement, and I, I, I agree uh, with with the point that was just said that this is a uh, a global. Uh, transnational uh, movement, which uh, exists either, which has similarities in, in many places, and it draws some of, uh, of the same sort of superstar intellectuals. And I wouldn't be surprised if we had Joseph Stieglitz and, and, and some other people coming to uh, Place, Place de la République. Um, I, I, I would agree, again, on the question of demands, I, I perfectly understand the point that these are, are, are things that are too big. But in Occupy Wall Street, you had part of the demand in the name. It was against Wall Street. It was against finance in the wake of the world's biggest financial crisis and holding those banks accountable. In the case of Nuit Debout, there is no such thing. There's not even a, an inkling of a focus. Um, and uh, in However, Spain, there was a housing bubble. And again, a lot of the anger was directed against uh, financial institutions. In Greece, the Troika, all that were clearly identified opponents. Uh, Nuit Debout has not come out and said, we are against uh, the tax evading French corporation or against the uh, treacherous uh, French government. It hasn't designated an opponent. Um, and it hasn't really even spelled out uh, compelling issues that it has a problem with. Mm -hmm. so, so that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying, uh, uh, you know, 10 points, but just something uh, that we can, we can kind of uh, try to argue with. Nicholas, looking at the identity of the protesters, well, the they're not necessarily from the banlieue, the underprivileged parts of society, are they? Uh, are they, is it ultra cynical? Or is it maybe accurate to say that a lot of these guys are privileged white kids who are probably just rebelling against their parents? I know this is an exceptionally <laughs> sensitive point for the protesters. I, I discussed it with them uh, when I was there last week, and they don't like to hear that this is a movement of middle-class white people. Here, here's what I can say uh, as, a, as an observer. I went and I saw the people who were in the uh, Assembly General who were sitting there, and I must say I saw only white faces, and, and they were people uh, between 20 and 30 years old who looked to me like they were students or young workers. Um, I don't think that's a reason to dismiss the movement. I think that uh, many movements begin in universities, in activist circles, and spread to other sectors of society. Uh, and, and, and it's no doesn't mean they're any less formidable for it. Uh, however, I think that Nuit Debout so far has not been able to bridge the gap to uh, some of the frustrations and the issues that exist in the French banlieue, which are distinct from their own right now. Mm -hmm. um, there is a big gap between uh, the frustration that, that led to rioting or, or uh, clashes with police in the banlieue and, and the type of issues that are being discussed in Place de la République okay. right now. And the two things are not yet joined together. Okay, Michael, I have to wrap, but I've got a final question for you. Um, as we button this up, let's take this back to the United States. Are you firmly of the belief that Bernie Sanders is the culmination of, of five years of this grassroots activism? I think it's pretty hard to deny that. I think you cannot look at Bernie Sanders' platform, his, his core arguments, his language, his, ab his vocabulary itself. It emerged precisely out of the Occupy. I mean, Bernie has been a, a left, a, an independent, and a socialist you know, politician now for decades. But his language, the fact that it's resonating the way it is, the fact that people have opened their ears, what Occupy did, it, cha it changed the conversation. That is what the establishment was able to say about it. But it really created this new vocabulary. And Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, who, who really is the f carrier of the Democratic Party now in the, se in the Senate, um, they're speaking the language, really, of the 99%. They're saying, rein in their banks. They're saying, make the connections between how Wall Street is governing Mm -hmm. Washington, essentially, hiring our, okay. you know, paying for our legislators, point, paying for our point legislation. Well made, Michael. So I think Bernie, yeah. absolutely. Sure. Yes. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. Final comment from Nicholas. I want to ask him inversely, is the same thing happening 
on the right. Maybe we had the Tea Party five years ago, and we have Trump now, and, and, and a wave of, of right-wing movements throughout Europe as well. Is the same phenomenon happening in the mirror image as well, Nicholas? Final answer, please, less than 30 seconds. I think, uh, you know, it's easy to get too abstract when, when answering this type of question. But yes, uh, indisputably, um, there is uh, uh, the, the, the anti-establishment movements on the right and on the left are uh, joined together by a suspicion of globalization and a, a loss of uh, reference points in the world. Um, and and there, you know, people react in different ways. On, on, on the left, uh, there's a reaction against banks, against the establishment on the right. Uh, there is a, a, an isolationist instinct and, and suspicion of outsiders, but, but these are similar phenomena, uh, and I think they react to a, a feelings of alienation and, and fear about the future. Um, and you know that's that's something that leaders have to address in the United States and in France to to, to make sure that the most populist, the most extreme uh, political movements don't come into power. Nicholas Bonica and Michael Leverton, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Well, joining me now from London to discuss whether the world's youngest nation can recover from civil war is Richard Cockett. He's the former Africa editor of The Economist and author of Sudan, Darfur and the Failure of an African State. Thank you very much for joining us, Mr. Cockett. Um, so many people suffering, billions squandered. There's a currency crisis, there's no cash, there's no petrol, there's little food. Is it as bad as it has ever been for South Sudan? Um, in short, yes. Um, the situation is very bad and it's been deteriorating pretty rapidly, really, since, um, since independence. But as you say, uh, you said in your piece before, the situation has particularly worsened since the civil war broke out in December 2013. Now, people are hopeful that they can rubber stamp this unity government and, and, and stitch things together. But, you know, I wonder, even if President Salva Kiir and Rick Machar put aside their differences for the sake um, of the people of South Sudan, there have been so many breakaway factions from Machar him, himself. How likely is it that that unity government will hold? Yeah, I don't think anyone is expecting too much from this uh, unity government. It's been called the transitional government, and the idea is that uh, Riek Machar, in particular, is restored to his previous position as first vice president. They'll patch up his differences with the president, Salva Kiir, and then they'll stagger towards the holding of fresh elections so we can have a new government um, with a new mandate. But no one is under any illusions that uh, all the divisions uh, still exist and the cleavages that between uh, the two biggest ethnic groups, uh, the Nur and the Dinka, represented by Kia and Machar still exist. I mean, you have to remember, you know, these, pe these two have really been um, fighting each other, uh, you know, for decades. The whole uh, South Sudanese uh, liberation movement split apart in the early 90s. Again, Rick Machar breaking away from the main SPLM uh, to fight against them, even when both sides were fighting against the North. So these fractures and divisions, these fissures, in South Sudan have always been there. They patch things up temporarily and then the whole thing falls apart. So that's, that's been a pretty consistent pattern now. Mm -hmm. Five years on, is it wrong or even maybe offensive to ask, particularly to South Sudanese, if South Sudan broke away prematurely? Well, I called South Sudan originally a, a, a pre-failed state, which was a, a, a kind of uh, probably a rather over-aggressive, uh, nasty judgment. Um, but I, I think, but nonetheless, uh, I think it was right for the new state to, to break away. After all, it had been fighting a very vicious civil war against North Sudan, which is now Sudan, for 50 years, in which, you know, millions of people um, had died. Uh, and the North had been fighting what it declared a jihadist war against its Christian South. So I think uh, it was perfectly right for South Sudan to break away um, because the whole country had never worked. It had been fighting since independence in 1956. So I don't think anyone in South Sudan would question its right to have broken away. And the fact that uh, about 99%, over 99% of the population voted to break away tells you everything about the popular will. Richard Cockett, thank you very much for joining us. In today's picture this, we have a nation in mourning. On Sunday, Ecuador suffered its strongest earthquake in decades. Hundreds are dead, thousands injured, and many more trapped waiting to be rescued. Let's take a look.
Today's newsmaker has been the Occupy movement, as we asked whether it can lead to political change. It's been five years since the original Occupy started on Wall Street. In that time, a number of protest movements have become political parties. Some have even become governments. And while the Occupy movement has not, unlike some of its European counterparts, followed that trend, it has changed the discourse of politics in the US. Income equality and the political power of corporate lobbyists have become crucial debating points for all the presidential hopefuls. And so, while Occupy may not have found power in the traditional way, the influence it has is just beginning to be seen. You've been watching this edition of The Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.